Hi, so I think I am live. I hope I'm live. So, hey, I'm Gigi from Day One Careers. Um, I have no idea how many people are on the call. So, would someone please just do me a quick favor and drop a little comment? Oh, I can see there's already a couple of comments there. Awesome. So, it sounds like you can hear me. Just type, yeah, Gigi, I can hear you so that I know that all of my tech is working properly. Waiting, waiting. Someone type hi, Gigi. Yep, okay, cool. It looks like you can hear me. That's awesome. Right, so that was Otman. Great, fabulous. So, going to take a few minutes for people to show up because it takes a, a little bit of time for YouTube to pop up that we are live. So whilst we wait for people to arrive, I will introduce myself and maybe in turn, if you would just like to let me know uh, where you are coming from, I mean, you're not coming from there, you're probably sat there at the moment, but if you would just like to say, hi, I'm whoever and I'm from wherever in the world, it's always nice to know how far I'm reaching. I don't know if you all saw last week's video, but I am far better prepared this week. I'm not wearing my Winnie the Pooh jumper. I'm appropriately branded uh, and I even have some makeup on. <laughs> so it's less of a horror show this week <laughs> than it was last week. So introductions for myself and then I will say hello to a few of you. So. I am Gigi from Day One Careers. I'm assuming you already know that because you follow the YouTube channel. For a little bit of context, I'm an ex-Amazon bar raiser. I worked at Amazon for, I think, five odd years. And in that time, I became a bar raiser. Uh, quickly, a bar raiser is part of an elite group of trained people who effectively facilitate the loop process at the end of the interview process. And they're the people that effectively um, have the decision as to whether you get hired or not. So I was a bar raiser, absolutely loved it. Um, but as a bar raiser, I started to notice some kind of things going on with candidates where they were perhaps doing some crazy things that I was unsure as to why they were doing them, started to ask candidates questions and discovered that they were following some advice on the web. I went onto the web to find out about this advice and discovered there was a whole bunch of horrific horrific advice out there in terms of Amazon interviews, uh, which obviously as a Amazonian ownership, customer obsession, all of that bothered me greatly. So I started up a little YouTube channel to try and share my knowledge, extensive knowledge and insights with you all. I left Amazon and decided that I might see if I could turn this into something and that was a little bit of a side hustle. Started up my own business, then met Yevgeny, who is my business partner, who was doing something similar. We joined forces and we created Day One Careers. So you'll know we've got hundreds of videos on the YouTube channel that tell you loads and loads about the interview process. We also have our own little courses that we offer. Little and not little is like 15 hours worth of content. Courses that we offer, and I'll give you a link to a free one of those at the end of the session. So hang around. But we also do these free sessions where you can come and ask us questions us, it's me, Evgeny's not coming this week. Um, you can ask me questions and I will do my best to answer them. Generally, I think I probably can answer about 80% of the questions that I'm asked. Some questions are way too specific. So here's some guidance on what questions not to ask. Um, if you have a specific interview for a specific job function, there's no point in asking me exactly what type of technical questions exactly that you're going to get because there are tens of thousands of job families in Amazon and I cannot be an expert in all of them and know that minutiae of detail about them. On the other hand, don't say to me, hi, Gigi, I've got an interview tomorrow. Any tips? Because, yeah, thousands of them, hundreds of them, they're all on the YouTube. So ask me a specific question, but try not to ask me a too technically specific question, if that makes sense. So with that said, uh, why don't we get going? I'm just going to say hi. And then whilst I'm saying hi, please, people, put your questions into the chat here on the side. And all I'll do is just scroll down and pick them out in the order in which you made them. I'll drop them onto the screen here. So just don't write anything that you wouldn't want everyone on YouTube to see that you wrote. All right. So we have Valerie from Austin, Texas. Very nice. Uh, oh, Otman, so you're Moroccan and you live in Italy. I'd love to go to Morocco. I was talking to my husband about that the other day. Desperate to go to Morocco. So that's going to be one of our big adventures. Jonathan, you're here. Hello. Welcome, Jonathan. 
Right, so Otman's got a question, so I'm going to start with that one, and then anybody else, please do um, ask your question in the box there below. So let's just pull this one in. I haven't read it yet, so let's just see what happens when I pull it in. Okay. Okay, so you have a final panel interview tomorrow, four panels, five interviewers. Okay, so you've got one shadow there in one of the interviews. The first panel has two interviewers from different countries. Are they typically bar raisers in the first rounds? Okay. Okay, right. So language aside, okay. So what you're saying to me, Otman, I think is that you've got your final panel, which is also called loop. And in your loop, you have four separate interviews. So four separate hour long sessions with different individuals. In one of those interviews, you have two people and they apparently are in different countries. OK, then you have a separate question, which is, are they typically bar raisers in the first rounds? So I think what you're asking me is, is it usually the bar raisers who are early on in those four individual hour long interviews? I hope I've understood that correctly. So the answer to the question is, do the bar raisers tend to be the first interviewers you have in your stack of interviews? The answer is no. There's no typical placement of the bar raiser. It's basically just a function of when they're available. So if, they're, if you are happen to do your interviews on one day, lots of people do them across two days, even three days, it's simply a case of when is the bar raiser available in that period of time, and they will slot them in accordingly. There's no particular order in which your interviewers are presented to you in your interview schedule. Um, you didn't ask me this question, but as a point of clarification, you said the first panel has two interviewers from different countries. So I just want to talk to you about why that might be happening to you. It's either going to be that in that interview where you have two people, one of those people is training to become an interviewer. It can be the person who is leading the interview and the person who is listening in the background is the trained interviewer who is basically overseeing their education in learning to be an interviewer or it could be the other way around where the person leading the interview is the trained interviewer and the person in the background is the one that is listening in and shadowing and learning how to be an interviewer so that's kind of the one possibility with the two variables the other possibility which also has two variables is that that interview is the bar raiser interview and the person interviewing you could be the qualified bar raiser and the person kind of listening in the background is what they call a Brit which is a bar raiser in training and they are listening to the bar raisers interview so they can learn how to interview as a bar raiser. Now, interviewing as a bar raiser is, in fact, exactly the same as interviewing elsewhere, but nonetheless, that's part of the Brit program. Or it could be the other way around, where the Brit is the person leading the interview and the qualified bar raiser is sat back listening to the Brit because what they'll then do is when they leave the interview, the bar raiser will provide some feedback to the Brit in terms of how they conducted the interview and the same would happen whether the if it was the normal interviewer who's learning was leading the interview and the trained interviewer was the one sitting in the shadows listening in okay so hopefully that answered your question and a little bit more so i'm going to pop you back now i cannot see any other questions it's a very quiet day today not that many people on the stream so if you have a question, please do pop it in. And if you don't, if no one has any questions, then I'll just go and make the dinner <laughs> because I was wondering who was going to make the dinner tonight. Um, but it might well be me. So everyone, if you have questions, please fire away uh, because if you don't have any questions, then you don't need me here. So let's just see. OK. OK. 
here we go. Here's a question from Shabriaz. I hope I have pronounced that properly. I apologize profusely if I've butchered your name. Please apologize to your parents for me. Okay. I have my hiring manager interview next week. Preps coming along well. Good. Your question is, if I have a star that can be used for a bar raiser, can I use it just once? Hmm. Okay. So I don't quite understand the premise of the question because any answer you have can be used for any interviewer. There's no answer that is unique to use for a bar raiser. So I'm going to park that bit of your question for now. And I'm going to take the second bit, which is, can I use it just once? So can you use the same answer more than once across an interview process? OK. And then, oh, you've clarified it there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm going to pop that up. Could I repeat it during the course of my interview since it's an actual big professional achievement? OK. So the broad advice is. And we'll work backwards from the broad advice, from gen kind of general to more specific. The broad advice is if you can avoid repeating an example, you should. Because what Amazon is looking for is people who consistently perform at a high standard. So the more unique stories that you can pull out that are impressive, the more you appear to be consistently in every day, every week, every month performing at a really high standard. Now that's kind of the top level advice. The reality is it's hard to come up with as many completely unique stories as the Amazon interview process would need you to come up with. So for example, if you're interviewing as an L6, you'll have five people in your loop each of them given two leadership principles, maybe asking you three questions. So that's 15 questions already at loop. Before that, you would have gone through another round where someone's maybe asked you another two or three questions. So now we're up to 18 questions. You may have even had a round before that. Some, two, some teams have two early screens before loop, some have one. Imagine you've got two early screens and now you're up to something along the lines of 21 odd questions. It's pretty hard, even when you've got kind of a tenured career history, to come up with 21 examples. So it is it kind of expected and forgiven if you need to repeat an example in order to have enough examples to answer questions. How many times it's acceptable to repeat is not defined by Amazon. There's no document anywhere that says this many repeats is permissible. It's very subjective and different bar raisers and hiring managers feel slightly differently about the numbers of repeats that they consider to be acceptable. I will give you my point of view based on my experience as a bar raiser, uh, how I felt and the general feel of the people that I worked with across my couple of hundred bar raising debriefs. Generally, the more senior you are, the less tolerant your panel will be of repeats. If you're senior, you should be a high performer. If you're a high performer, you should have a lot of consistent high performance going on in your career history. So it's less permissible um, and you've been around longer, quite frankly. The more junior you get, kind of the more forgiveness you're given for repeating because if you're a pretty junior person then you may only have a couple of years of professional experience and therefore it's pretty hard to come up with 20 unique examples across a period where maybe you've only been working for about four years. What number would I tell you in terms of how many times you can repeat? You know if you're a L7 probably I personally would get a little bit uncomfortable if I had more than two repeats for an L7. If it was an L6, L5, somewhere along the lines of two or three would be OK. But then I start getting uncomfortable. If you're as far down as an L4, you can easily get away with four, five stories repeated. The goal is to make sure that if you're going to repeat a story, that you make it sound very different 
<coughs> excuse me, you make it sound very different between the two times you use that story. And you lean very heavily into one leadership principle for one time you tell it, and you lean very heavily into a different leadership principle the second time you tell it. Ideally, you want leadership principles. Excuse me, I'm going to cough again. I'm really sorry. <coughs> I apologize. I was coaching someone before this, and I've literally spent the last 90 minutes talking and another hour ahead of me. Um, what was I saying? Right. Um, if you're going to use the same story for different leadership principles, my strong advice is you try and choose leadership principles that feel very different. So uh, two leadership principles that feel very different would perhaps be earn trust and deliver results, like kind of objectively quite different leadership principles. Leadership principles that would be quite similar might be customer obsession and earn trust. You can see where those two leadership pr principles probably, you know, jump over each other in terms of where the Venn diagram might land. If you want to make it feel like a very different story when you tell it the second time, your best bet is to try and find two leadership principles that are really different to each other. And then that way, when you focus on one leadership principle versus the other leadership principle, it's going to sound like a very different story when you tell it repeatedly. OK, I hope that answers your question. So I'm going to pop you back in. Folks, please do continue to ask questions. Don't be shy. There are no bad questions. There might be questions I can't answer, but that doesn't make them bad questions. I will tell you if I feel I can't answer a question. OK, so let me see what else we have here. We have Jonathan, so let's just pop Jonathan in there. I love your profile picture, Jonathan. This is part of what I love about doing these lives is people's profile pictures. <laughs> They're so awesome. I'm obviously a really nosy person, but I love seeing people's different profile pictures. So that's a super cute one. Right. I left my job in October 2022. OK. What would be the best way to fill in that gap? I took a two month vacation, then I started to learn German. Jonathan, what do you mean by fill in that gap? Are you talking about in your resume or are you talking about in interview? Oh, OK. Hang on. There's a follow up here. Would that sound OK or should I come with a better answer? You have an interview tomorrow with Amazon Germany. OK, um, I'm an advocate of just telling the truth. So I'm not sure someone would actually stop you and say, uh, please, Jonathan, explain to me what you've been doing since October 2022. We're now in mm, October 2023. Have you spent your past 12 months? I'm not sure someone would ask you that, but it is possible. So I would tell the truth. You know, if you got laid off, if you decided you wanted a career break, it doesn't matter. Any of those things are the truth. Um, being able to tell them that you use that time productively rather than, I don't know, sunbathing in your garden would be useful because it's always ideal to be able to tell a, a potential employer that you are a driven, self-motivated person that uses their time well to develop themselves and that you have a growth mindset. So by all means, be honest about how you ended up in a situation where you you were out of work for the past 12 months and tell them you've been learning German or you've been supporting your family. No one's going to judge you on what you did with your time, but to know that you used your time effectively would certainly be an advantage. I hope that helps. Okay. Okay, cool. So I'm going to pop you back. There we go. By all, and anyone who's asking repeated questions, feel free to ask repeat questions. We've got a pretty small audience today, so you're not hogging the limelight. Just throw them out there and it will at least give me something to say. Otherwise, it's going to be very embarrassing to be sat here on my Todd with nothing to say. So <clears throat> you have another question, if that's fine. As I've said, it's fine. What about talking about examples from initial years of my career eight years ago? 
they are good examples I could use to answer LPs. Okay, yes, it's a good question. Uh, I've just realized like you can barely oh, see the bottom half of me. Can you see my face? Oh, and I've got my glasses on. You can see the reflection of my window there. That's better. Um, right. So once again, we go back to our general advice would be not to go back much further than five years in your career history. So there's two reasons for this. The first reason is, in all probability, if you go back, depending on where you are in your career, but if you go back much more than five years, it's very possible that you will be in a role that is more junior than the role that you are applying for. So even if the example is a good illustration of the leadership principle, you may fall into a trap of talking about situations that do not have the scope and the complexity of the role that you are applying for now. So if you talk in large part about stories that are not as complicated or as challenging as the work that you will face in Amazon, in all probability, your interviewer or your panel, depending on where you are in the process, might say, well, yeah, he certainly demonstrated earned trust, but it was a very simple story and he's going to face much bigger challenges here in Amazon. And I have no evidence that he would be able to cope with that level of challenge. So you have to be really mindful when you're coming up with your stories as to whether they are as complicated and complex, <coughs> complicated and complex is the same word, whether they have the complexity and the scope of the role that you're applying for today in Amazon. So that's the first reason why we would generally say don't go back more than five years. The second reason we would say don't go back much more than five years is if a large number of your stories require you to or do go back four years, five years, six years, seven years, interviewers are at risk of wondering what in God's name have you been doing for the past one, two, three years that you have failed to demonstrate said leadership principle in such a way that is a high performance demonstration. Because when I'm hiring someone at Amazon or anywhere else, quite frankly, what I'm trying to do is use their experience of the past to predict how they're going to perform in the future. So if you tell me a story that I'm impressed with that happened only six months ago, I could be pretty confident that what you demonstrated six months ago. <coughs> I'm so sorry, everyone. What you demonstrated six months ago, you're likely to be able to do tomorrow if you arrived in my organization. If you tell me a story of a leadership principle that you demonstrated seven years ago, and you don't have any other examples of demonstrating that leadership principle in the recent past, I'm going to have far less confidence that when you land in my business tomorrow, you'll be able to demonstrate that leadership principle because as far as you've explained to me, you haven't demonstrated that, past, that leadership principle for the past seven years. So why would I be confident that if you arrive tomorrow, suddenly you'd start demonstrating again? That said, it's not to say that you should never use examples from much further back than five years, but you need to be trying to make sure that the majority of your stories are focused in that period, that window of time. If you have a particular story that is so quintessentially demonstrative of your strength in something, then we would never, that goes back further than that, we would never say don't use it, quite the opposite. When I was interviewed at Amazon, I used a story that was 10 years old, but I used it because it, I felt it really demonstrated the DNA of Gigi and how I operate, regardless of what level I'm at. At the time, the story anyway, I was a very junior marketing manager and my key interaction in that story was the CEO of the largest telecom company in the UK. And the way that story went, um, it so demonstrated my strength in which at the time was have backbone, disagree and commit. I felt it was worth using. Turns out it was because they hired me. 
So by exception, by all means, go back further in time. But it needs to be a pretty impressive story that you really, really feel would blow the interviewer away if you told it for all of the reasons that I just described to you a second ago. Right, I hope that helps. I am going to pop you back in. Okay. Umesh, I'm working as a technical director. What are the key things Amazon look for in senior leader positions? It doesn't work that way, Umesh. They're not looking for key things in senior leader positions. They're looking for key things in the role that they're hiring for. So if you want to know what they're really looking for as regards the role that you're applying for, and you, I don't think you've mentioned it here, you need to look at the job description. And it will tell you there in black and white what they care about the most in terms of the leadership principles for that particular job. Um, there is a playlist on the YouTube channel that shows you how if I was trying to interpret the job description as to what they care about the most in terms of leadership principles, how I would go about it. It's a, I think there's a couple of videos in the playlist of me doing that live for candidates through YouTube. So go and check that out and then it should be a good guide for how you can look at the job description that you, you want to apply for and deconstruct it. Um, that aside, my point about scope and complexity that I mentioned a minute ago is obviously valid here. Um, it's valid for all roles, but it gets more and more important the more senior you get, right? So the other thing besides the leadership principles that are the key leadership principles for that particular role, they're obviously in their more senior people looking for more scope and more complexity and bigger impact in their stories. Okay, Umesh, I'm going to pop you back in. I hope that helps. I am going to pick another story now. Mm. Mm. So this is um, Otman again. So your English is not so perfect and sometimes you feel blocked during a conversation. But I can explain my ideas with some simple basic words. Is that a problem? If you can explain your ideas, and the interviewer can understand what you're saying, both in terms of what you're saying and the contents of what you're saying, then it's not a problem. No one's going to employ you um, or not employ you because you haven't got an extensive vocabulary of the most complex English words. That That's not the issue. I understand the problem with doing an interview in a second language, a third language. And it is true to say that in some instances, candidates struggle to articulate the concept of what they are describing to the interviewer. What I suggest you do if you are concerned about that is that you talk slowly. If someone's talking in a second language that they don't necessarily have a fluent grasp on, if they speak fast, it doesn't give the interviewer time to reinterpret the words that they're using and click the concepts in their head because whilst their brain is thinking okay what did he mean by that the person's moved on to the next thing that they want to say so take your time when you are telling your stories both to enable your interviewer to potentially process words that aren't quite right but are in the context of something and also, Otman, it will give you time to think about and plan exactly what you want to say before you actually open your mouth to speak. There is a basic level of English required in Amazon. Now, different roles will require a different level of what basic means. If you are interacting with other Amazonians, outside of your country, the country that you're employed to work in for Amazon, on a frequent basis, they would require a higher standard of English. If you're in a role where you would very rarely speak to anybody outside the country in which 
you are working for in Amazon, they'll require a lower standard of English. But just take your time, think about what you're going to say, and make sure you give the interviewer enough time to process what you're saying. I hope that helped. <clears throat> going to take another glass of water here. OK. So to give me time to cough once again, without coughing in all of your ears, and to have a glass of water, dregs of water. You see, it's got a label on it. That's embarrassing. That's one of my children's names. <laughs> I've obviously stolen their school bottle. Um, right, so before we continue on with the session, I need to ask you all a favor. So the content in Amazon, in YouTube, surfaces on the basis of popularity. And to get popular, it needs to have engagement. So the more thumbs up you give a piece of content, or if you write comments on a contact, that's an engagement signal that goes to the algorithm, which tells the algorithm this is good content, and it's more likely to surface. Now, you all know that there's a ton of content out there on Amazon, and a whole bunch of it, as I identified at the beginning of, my, of the session, is terrible. I put a lot of effort into creating high quality content for you and also for all of the other people who are in the same situation as you. So I really, really need you please to, whenever you watch a video, give it a thumbs up, write a little comment, even if it's just the thanks Gigi, and that will create positive signals which will boost my content. <coughs> Sorry, boost my content above the other not as good content on YouTube and you'll be doing everybody else who's in the same situation as you a big favor. So with that said, I'm going to ask you to take a few seconds just to give this uh, particular stream a little thumbs up. And whilst you're doing that, I'm going to play something that I find amusing, uh, even if you don't. It might be a bit, a little bit loud, so um, just pop your headphones off um, or in the back of your ear just in case it is a bit loud. And whilst we play that, you can please give the stream a bit of a thumbs up. Here we go. There we go. I always lose a few people when I play that because they always say, oh my gosh, she's a complete lunatic. And off they go. So I did lose a couple of people, but never mind. I thought it was fun anyway. So with that in mind, I had a chance to cough and drink some more water. So let me keep going and pick some more questions. Okay, Niraj. Okay. Oh, it's a bit of an unanswerable question, but here we go. Anyway, so good evening, Niraj. You've got your loop in two weeks. Question over quality of stories. I've realized that some stories won't be very impactful considering the amount of stories. How should I weigh the quality of impact over the number of stories I can repeat? Oh, I wish I had a formula for this, but I don't. It's a bit of a judgment call. Essentially, at the heart of your question is, is it better to repeat a story, repeat a good story, or is it better to have a unique average story? Hmm. I don't know that I have an answer for that, which I know is probably quite frustrating for you. At a high level, if we were to do a hierarchy, I would, as an interviewer, prefer a great, a unique great story, a repeated great story, an average story. So I think the truth is, Niraj, you're probably going to have to play with a blend of your repeat strong stories and your average stories. As long as you do as I described earlier on with your repeat strong story and try and make it seem as unique as possible by creating those two different versions of it with very different leadership principles. So I'm afraid I don't have a formula that says for every two unique stories, you can have one, uh, every two repeat unique stories, you can have one average story. I wish I did, but I don't. But think about it in that hierarchy. Best is obviously a unique strong story. Second is a duplicated strong story. 
And then the third is an average story. You don't have to be bar raising for every single leadership principle in order to get hired. You have to be bar raising in the ones they really care about. And then when they look at the overall picture, you need to be leaning towards bar raising rather than leaning towards average. I hope that helps in some way. I appreciate it. It's not as scientific as I'm sure you would like. And I would definitely love to be able to tell you. OK, so. Mm. The principle insists on the high standards encompasses some of the other principles, too. Mm, not really. Sometimes there's hardly any difference between this and customer obsession. Mm, not really. Um, how do we answer questions about it in such scenarios? Because the examples can get repeated in such situations. OK, so. There's going to be overlap, but it's small, right? Insisting on the highest standards is all about insisting. Doesn't matter what it is, but everybody else thinks something's good enough. You don't. You force everyone to improve it, do better. Everybody else, uh, or you spot an opportunity where everything's chuggling along fine, but you think it can be better, and you drive that improvement forward. Now, that may have a customer element in it if this thing that you're trying to insist on the highest standard is a customer focused one. But equally, it could be something that's non customer focused at all. The context is what's driving you, I think, to think that there's overlap. That overlap doesn't necessarily exist if someone is thinking about a scenario that has nothing whatsoever to do with customers. That said, <clears throat> The trick is to focus your story on the particular leadership principle. And it may be that other leadership principles bubble up as you tell that story. They inevitably do. Right? No situation we ever get into in work is only ever going to touch on one particular management capability, which is what leadership principles are effectively. They're management capabilities. So it's very possible and almost definite that as you tell a story, other things are going to bubble up. Um, but the leadership principles themselves are actually, if you understand them thoroughly, quite distinct. They have a little bit of overlap, but in the main, they're very different. Um, there you go. So I think that answers your question, Ramiz. I'm not entirely sure what you meant by how do we answer questions about it in such scenarios, because examples can get repeated in such situations, because I'm not sure now if you're asking me about repeating the same story. Um, but as I said um, earlier on, if you're going to repeat a story, try and repeat it for a very different leadership principle. So if you think that this is a good customer obsession story um, and you've also got some insisting on the higher standards, you can definitely create it as two different stories. It just so happens a customer that happens to be involved when you are insisting on the higher standards doesn't necessarily mean insist on the higher standard overlaps with customer obsession as a pure leadership principle. I think I, I hope I understood that properly. Anyway, I'm going to move on. And if I've made no sense whatsoever, feel free to tell me a little bit further down and ask me a different way. Uh, OK, it's you again, Ramiz. OK, is it OK to provide some examples of failure or do we only need to give examples where we've won? Um, well, the questions that you're going to be asked inevitably force you into one or the other of those routes. So you there are questions in the Amazon interview question bank where the way into the leadership principle is a failure. So, for example, um, customer obsession. Uh, no, let's use um, let's use earn trust. So there will be question in the Amazon interview question bank, which is about tell me about a time when you failed to meet a commitment to a colleague or a peer. That's a failure question. There are also questions in earn trust that could be uh, positive way ins. So let me just think what question is a positive way in on and trust so mm, okay so there's another question which is tell me about a time where um you what's the question go tell me about a time where you significantly improved 
um, morale in your organization? Well, that's a positive question about earned trust and therefore you're going to be talking about a positive thing. So it's not really up to you whether you choose a negative or a positive example. It's up to the person who's asking you the question about the leadership principle as to whether they're going to ask you a question that is a negative or a positive way in to that leadership principle. Because what you're supposed to be talking about is the leadership principle. The failure itself is irrelevant. So if, for example, someone's asking you about tell me about a time where you failed to meet uh, a commitment to a team member, what did you do? How did you respond? Well, they don't really want to hear about the failure. They want to hear about the team member bit. How did you build bridges with that team member? How did you right the wrong and build their trust and earn that relationship back? The failure is just context for hearing all about how you engage with that individual that you let down. Vice versa, if the question is, tell me about a time where you um, materially improved morale. Um, they don't necessarily want to know exactly what you did, but they want to understand the improvement of morale. What was the situation of the people in the team at the time? What were their needs? How did you improve their morale? What were they feeling? How did you lean into what they were feeling? So on and so forth. I hope that makes sense and it's helpful. So Z. Z, this is an excellent question, but I'm not sure. Oh, I think you're talking about someone else's question earlier on. I was getting confused. Like, oh, what's an excellent question? OK, let's move on then. Mm, pizza, hello. So this is interesting. I'm interviewing for a role that requires two years experience and you only have 10 months in an intern position but you've been moved to the final four rounds. So you've been moved to loop, final stage. Are roles that require two years experience junior roles? Well, yes, it would be a junior. That's probably an L4 position, which is the lowest position that they hire in corporate. There are lower level roles than that when you're talking about operations, warehouses and fulfillment system, fulfillment um, centers. So two years, yes, is a junior role. Uh, it's interesting that the role requires two years of experience, but they've seen your resume. They clearly know you've only got 10 months experience. <laughs> Today is not going well for me. It's interesting that they've decided to forego a requirement that they wrote in a document for two years and are seeing you, but they've decided that they're going to waive that two years experience and interview you. So fingers crossed for you. Good luck. Okay, let's just pop you back in. Okay. Hey, Fikeo. Um, so how long does it take Amazon to start a role recruitment? You've applied for a role and it's still live and my status still shows under consideration. Okay, so they will start interviewing people as soon as the role goes live. So as soon as the role goes live on the site or on LinkedIn or wherever it is, they will start accepting resumes, reading them and passing them through to the hiring manager. So the role is live that you have applied for. Now, why would your your particular status of that role continue to be under consideration rather than getting some kind of an outcome, be it an interview um, invite or a decline? That's open. Um, it could be that the hiring manager isn't around or isn't prioritizing reviewing resumes and your resume is sat in a queue in hire waiting for them to read. It could also be that your um, recruiter is perhaps falling a little bit behind and they haven't given you the outcome, either an um, invite to interview or an update on the system to say that your resume has been rejected, it's really impossible for me to tell. So all I can do is tell you they are already recruiting for the role that you've applied for because as soon as it goes up, they will start processing resumes. That's the answer to your question. So I know that's not helpful to you, but at least it answers on a factual basis. Okay. Hey, Peach, you've been here before, Peach. I seem to 
recall that name kind of stands out okay so your loop is scheduled for the 30th of November and it's been there and it's been scheduled since the 13th of October more than a month a half away is that normal okay so that's the first question also it's said to be a hiring even w forward slash more than one candidate do you have any explanation or, or advice okay I'm not quite sure what you mean by that second half so I'm going to make a guess but I might guess wrong so is it normal that your interview is a month and a half away um no I wouldn't say that was normal for the standard process where you're just hiring an individual and you know <clears throat> for an individual role a month and a half would be a very long time if you're um <clears throat> excuse me unless your hiring manager is very busy with op1 which is a planning process or if they're on vacation holiday whichever country you're in and um, that would be the only reasons i could imagine that they would book that far out other than if you are part of a um kind of a graduate intake process or uh, mba or interns in which case they run the interview process a bit differently and what they do is they stack everybody up and on a fixed day or two day period a whole group of interviewers are basically sat at their desks cycling through lots of different candidates you might speak to four or five candidates in an individual day as an interviewer those then you then at the end of the day you do a debrief and decide who you're going to pass on to the next day and then the whole thing happens again if that's the type of process that you're going through, which is a bit more of an event type process, then it would be very standard for it to be in the future because they have to plan it. They have to find like 20 different interviewers from around the business who can be in a certain place at their desk, I assume, for two whole days in a row, in which case you need to plan it quite far in advance so that everyone can clear their diaries and make sure that they're available for that session. So. I think that's what you may be talking about when you said even hiring even w forward slash more than one candidate i'm not quite sure um, but hopefully that goes some way to explain okay popping you back in these questions are great thank you everyone i really appreciate these let's see what else we have all right so Aman, so you have a phone interview for an accounting manager, ICL6. Okay. How complex should my examples be? Wonder if you can expect manager related questions, even though it's a particular role is IC. Okay. So I'd be surprised. I mean, I might be wrong, but I'd be surprised if an accounting manager is an L6. Usually it would be a senior accounting manager for it to be an L6, but okay, maybe I'm wrong there. If it's an IC, will you expect manager questions? No, because it's an IC. Why would they waste their time asking you questions to learn about your management skills if you're never going to be a man managing anyone? How complex should your examples be? It's impossible for me to be able to articulate that, unfortunately. I wish I could. It's one of those other things where you, uh, occasions where you would super love to be able to have a formula that says X plus Y equals complexity. There's no way me of me being able to answer that question for you or anybody else. So the only possible answer is as complex as you can possibly make it. It's a bit flippant, I know, but that's genuinely the only way to answer that question. Okay, I'm gonna pop you back in. Good luck, I hope it goes well for you. Uh, okay, moving on then. Okay, we have a few minutes left, so that's good. Legends of Dash, you've definitely been here before. I definitely remember that name and chatting with Yevgeny about it. So let's bring you up. So you have a loop this week and you're very nervous. I know it is a nerve wracking experience, but hopefully I'm here and all of my content is here to give you as much knowledge and uh, confidence as we can. The role is a technical one. Okay. Oh yes. Love it. Does Amazon value more of the behavioral or more of the coding system design? You're going to hate me, Legends of Dash, but it's both. There's no, there's no mathematical calculation that says 50% goes towards 
technical and 50% goes towards behavioral and this person got 20% in behavioral and 50% and therefore overall they got 70% does not work like that. So I'm afraid both are equally as important. Lots of people on the tech side make the mistake of thinking that as long as they can be technically impressive, Amazon will hire them. They won't. You have to raise the bar on the leadership principles as well as deliver high technical competency. So, but what I would, if you, I mean, you're talking about coding and system design. So I'm assuming you are a software development engineer. If you are, there is some amazing content on the YouTube channel with an ex Amazon scene, uh, I think it's an L7 software development manager. Uh, Venkat is his name. Or is it I can't remember now, actually. That's terrible. I've forgotten his name. Shame on me. I hope he doesn't watch this video. Um, go check it out. It's There's a playlist on the YouTube channel. It's so useful. He is brilliant at what he does, and it will definitely help you. We answer that conversation there about the importance of it, and it's the same. But go check it out. It will be useful. There's a little support tool as well that you can use. All right, moving on, moving on. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I'm just deciding which is the best question to pick. We've got eight minutes less. Okay, I'm going to pick this one. Romani. Mm. Is that Latin in your profile? Anyway, is it a good strategy to discuss being considered by other companies? If yes, how can I use this info as leverage during the interviews or offer negotiation? Okay, don't bother telling your interviewers that you're in negotiation with someone else. It doesn't help in any way to tell your interviewers. It does help to tell your recruiter that's the situation that you're in. Uh, because the reason I say this is the fact that someone else is considering you isn't going to make you more attractive to the actual interviewers. Amazon really doesn't care what other people think of you. They only care what they think of you. Once they get to the point where they've decided they like you and they want you, at that point, it is useful for the recruiter to know that other people like you and want you because it is, as you would imagine, leverage for your compensation negotiation. It's also useful leverage for the timeline of the process. If your recruiter knows that you are in process with somebody else or some, you are somebody else is awaiting your response to their offer, they're going to put the rockets on the interview process at Amazon so that they don't risk missing out on you because you've already accepted a role somewhere else. But it's only useful in compensation negotiation and in speeding up the process. It will not influence your interviewers to feel that you are a bar raising candidate just because somebody else wants to hire you. They don't care what other people think about you. They only care about what they think about you. I hope that helps. Um, now you've, oh, it's a Monty Python reference. I can't believe I missed it. Love Monty Python, Life of Brian. The Holy Grail. I, shame on me. I appreciate the culture, though. I very much appreciate the culture. OK. Let's see. OK, I'm going to pick this question here. Oh, I thought I was going to pick this question, but it hasn't shown up. There we go. Aman, hello, welcome. For a 60 minute phone interview, how many leadership principle questions can I expect? Is the number of questions asked correlated to the job level, i.e. more questions means more of a junior role? Okay, finally, I do definitely have a video about this on the YouTube channel, but the number of questions that you can expect is subject to variability based on three variables. 
the first variable is going to be how long your answers are. <laughs> that sounds inane, but it's true. The more, the longer you spend talking about your answers, the less time there is to ask a question. Okay, so that's one variable. The second variable is interviewer preference. There are some interviewers that for some unknown reason, I don't know why, want to get through a certain number of questions. Um, there is a best practice, which is to aim for three questions in an interview, because that gives you enough evidence, sample size, to be able to draw a conclusion on one or two leadership principles. However, there are some interviewers that for some reason have a preference and they want to get through four questions, five questions. So they might push you in terms of speeding up your response time so they can get through more questions. That is interviewer driven. It is not Amazon policy driven and therefore I can't give you a definitive answer in terms of how many questions does Amazon tell their interviewers to try and get through. Okay, so that's the second variable. The third variable is, as you've noted, driven by seniority. But it's driven by seniority based on kind of the first variable, which is how long your answers are. Because if you're quite a junior person, your answers are going to be quite short because your stories probably aren't going to be particularly complicated. And therefore, if you don't have particularly complicated stories, they don't take particularly long to sell, they're to tell and therefore your answers are quite short and therefore there is more time to ask you more questions. It is um, correlating, not causal, that being junior means you end up with more questions. Okay, that is that one. Okay, so I think we are now at time. So, I'm going to go and make my children's dinner. But before I go, I did tell you a little bit earlier on, if you were here, that we're giving away a free course. So please go. I never get this right. Please go here or to just the day one career dot careers website and you will get a pop up for a free course that we offer. That course is focused on the customer obsession leadership principle. At Day One Careers, we have created a system to help you deconstruct the leadership principles, completely understand what they're all about. We break it down into the different facets of the leadership principle. Every leadership principle has multiple facets to it, which I'm sure you've understood when you've started to read through them, but we've synthesized it for you. So it tells you the facets of customer obsession so that you can identify what type of stories from your career history would work for a customer obsession question. It then tells you what the interviewer is looking for. So what is it that they're looking for in your answer? And then there's also a bit at the end where there's a little mock interview as me interviewing me. So you can see how the whole thing comes together and you can also enjoy my acting skills and the various kind of hair and makeup that's going on. So please do take it, it's totally free. It also gives you access to our community on a platform called Heartbeat. And there you can ask us, Yevgeny and I, questions. You can ask other people who are in the process questions. You can arrange mock interviews with other people who are also interviewing at Amazon. So it's a super useful resource, even if it's only for um, meeting other people who are in the process as you are. So on that note, Thank you very much for joining today. Thank you very much for the awesome questions. I'm amazed that I've managed to talk for this long. Please do come back next week, same time, same place. Uh, we're still on next week. Yeah, so next week will be the last one we do. And I think I have a break for a couple of weeks because time zones get crazy because the UK changes their time zone before the US and it really messes my head. So next week, and then we've got a break for a couple of weeks and then we're back again. So thank you for joining. If you have an interview coming up this week, I have my fingers tightly crossed for you. Please make use of all the resources on the YouTube channel. I've obviously put a lot of effort into it. But until then, take care and it's lovely to speak to you all. Bye.